Hey, White Sox fans, I have my sound on. Uh, it took a while. Uh, that's why this is a delayed podcast, but we're doing a emergency uh, 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 panic uh, Sox Populi Fans for Sports Network podcast number 144 because we are going to overthrow Jerry Reinsdorf for at least a moment. Right now, the challenge in front of our esteemed panel from Southside Sox and on our Sox Pop podcast uh, is to what well, we can change. We can change right now. We we complain a lot. I mean, the the the, <laughs> the way the summer is looking like it's going to play out. We're going to have a lot of podcasts talking about what's wrong with the Chicago White Sox. That that's already tired, and it's April. So I'm trying to find different wrinkles, different ways we can be perhaps even proactive, maybe even I don't know about positive or optimistic, but just taking different angles to man, this team sucks. What a drag it is to watch. Because I'm not sure I want to host a podcast a week on that. I don't think I want to talk about it. I doubt I would want to listen to it. So in an effort to try to entice you to continue listening to the Fans for Sports Network and the best podcast on that network, Sox Populi, we're going to just try to be clever about it. We're going to try and come up with some things that might actually give you some hope or maybe speak to you as a listener. Uh, we've got plenty of great podcast stuff coming up as well. Visiting and Dugout, Crystal Keith with us here right now. Visiting and Dugout, I believe it's already the 10th episode. Crystal, is she is the smart one. She said, you know what? I don't, I don't have to talk about this team. I'm going to talk to other teams and just get some oxygen in the room. Very uh, clever. That's We got that coming up in advance of the Twin Series. We've got uh, Birdo from the West Side. That's Rob Coletti. He is going to go back and guest star on the Sharing Sox podcast, which is where he started with us at Southside Sox uh, with the Allens. Uh, and then he ended up doing his uh, big blurt with Bill Meinke uh, there for a while. So he had a podcast with us for a while. He's going to be on. You probably want to tune in on that. We got a lot of stuff continuing to roll out at you, including overthrowing Jerry, I was trying to determine the draft order. We're going to do this as a bit of a draft. I'll go last because no one wants to hear what I have to say anyhow. I believe seniority may have Crystal O'Keefe, host of Visiting Dugout, and a very popular, popular figure, probably the most popular figure on the Sox Populi podcast uh, here. I believe she gets to go first. Crystal O'Keefe, if you are in charge of the White Sox. That isn't even just GM. If you're taking over the whole thing, you're handed over the keys like Bill Vec famously was in the mid-70s, uh, what is the first thing you're going to do? So I, I'm i not going to steal the obvious answer first. I'm going to let other people do that <laughs> just because, in my opinion, it is the most unrealistic option. Um. So mine is just start figuring out who we can sell off come, you know, trade deadline time, who we can get rid of, who we really want, um, you know, start, start saving some money up and just sell, sell, sell. It worked for the Cubs a couple years ago. They're actually like fun to watch now. So sell. Oh, man, we're already dragged into a bleed cubby blue podcast. Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, okay, well, that presumes, so let's let's have a little discussion on Crystal's idea here. That presumes we do have objects of value that we would trade. Uh, what do we all think about that? Because clearly Rick Hahn overvalues his assets or can't figure out what his true assets are. Uh, do we have things to to sell? Uh, Crystal, you can take that first, but I mean, uh, uh, you know, that's a, when the team is... <laughs> As bad as it's basically ever been coming out of the shoot, um, you know, it doesn't yeah. look like the guys we've hyped are, are so hypeable. I mean, this is going to hurt a lot of feelings, but Tim Anderson could go. I mean, yeah, he's been injured, so we haven't seen him. And that's, you know, a, a part of why it's been so bad lately. But we've got pieces like Tim. We've got pieces like Yoan Mankata, who also had kind of a hot start, but could I feel it could play better somewhere else. So those are kind of my top two. And then I, I feel like just have a fire sale on the bullpen. Clearly they will be good somewhere else. <laughs> uh, other thoughts on what our assets are and, and about this, this strategy. So there's one quality I think that the Sox are going to rely on when it comes time to sell these guys in July is that 
I think there is going to be enough of a sense that teams will think that the White Sox are just so bad at what they do that these guys are more talented <laughs> than they've shown in this uniform. Like they'll see a guy like Giolito and I've seen what he did in 2019. And it's like, there's just something about the White Sox, White Soxing it up that there's value there that I, as a smart GM and a smart organization can get out of these guys that might give them a tiny bit more value. If still, below what they would have been, you know, a few years ago before we watched them play for the White Sox for a considerable amount of time. So you're saying, Adrian, as we are talking right now in this podcast, the Tampa Bay Rays might be studying a few of our players very closely. Yes, and like the, the ineptitude of Rick Hahn is a benefit, is a weapon in this case, <laughs> yeah. as they, uh, you know, continue to play White Sox baseball uh, even already today. Uh, other thoughts on what to sell or who who to sell and and whether this is an app strategy. You know, my thoughts on selling are I, I have mixed feelings about it. Not just from a fan perspective of oh, I don't want them to trade the good players. Is that not only? Yeah, I don't really trust Han to get anything close to appropriate value for any of those guys. I mean. The th- as we've talked about before, the three trades that really that really made this quote unquote you know rebuild, without which it wouldn't have even been a rebuild, were that brought us Cease and Eloy and Moncada and Kobe. Those kind of trades aren't happening happening anymore, specifically because of those deals. Like other teams stopped, you know, overpaying for stars on a premium. So I don't know. I've said this in the Slack. I'm at a point now where. If they're not going to get, if rather than just trading Tim Anderson and Cease and you know, Lucas Giolito is not worth trading at this point, you might as well ride it out so you can get down the stretch with them. Like it's at this point, I want them to just ride it out to the end. Keep doing the stupid retooling bullshit. Make yourselves look stupid. Show us how show us how bad at actually GMing you are instead of continuing to kick the can down the road and say, oh, hey, this is the third time, but we're really going to do it right this time. No, if we're going to face plant, I want to watch your face drag drag on the payment you know like that like so those those are the guys who you would trade if you were gonna gonna do that it would be cease and tim and realistic i mean the one the luis robert is probably the one who has the most trade value right now because of his contract and the fact that he hasn't been like totally underwater for the majority of the last two years or so i don't even know if it's worth it i would just rather watch these guys and go down with the ship to an extent yeah there is yeah there, with that said like there is no hurry to this even if they're going to sell this year if they're going to be bad there's no reason not to wait until the last minute of it the, there's no reason they try to get ahead of it because like you have to win this year because literally you know at least two-thirds of your rotation that is barely held together right now is gone you had you don't have replacements for them right now let alone next year like you're not going to spend to replace them so this is kind of the only year so like we got to kind of see what happens um but it just it seems like before too long you're going to have to have those conversations and like i don't know if you're not going to you know spend on seas then that's the conversation you're going to have to have and this is the cubs conversation they decided they weren't going to pay these guys so we're going to sell everybody if the Sox decide they're not going to pay these guys then they're going to have to have those tough conversations but like in the meantime you know guy i think jake berger and mancata probably have the same trade value at this moment just from a somebody seeing like what they're available for right now, what they're getting paid, what uh, expectation I have of what they can do. Like, so, you know, necessarily, yeah, I'd love to say like, just trade Makata, trade Eloy, trade all these guys. But like, you have to be cognizant of what somebody's willing to give you for them too. We can't just, you might as well just DFA them all. If that, you know, if you're just trying to churn the roster, like a, you know, an NFL team. Yeah, I thought it was interesting to hear from Crystal that, you know, we're going to like save some money too. What is what is Crystal, what is your attitude about uh Jerry and his money? It's always a topic with uh <laughs> it's always a topic with the White Sox and therefore it becomes a discussion point for the fan base. Um I mean, of course we don't care about, you know, Jerry's money, but I guess it's more uh uh the idea of spending it unwisely or just wasting it, which obviously they have a, I think I just looked it up where they got 160, 180 million payroll. It's not nothing. And boy, it's, they're not getting a little, their dollars per win is very poor right now. So. Um, well, see, I fall in the camp of like eat the rich. There should be no billionaires anyway. Um, 
yeah, I don't care about Jerry's money. He's clearly not investing it wisely in either one of his teams that he owns. Um, yeah, I, I don't care at all. It, I don't even think it factors into this conversation anymore. He's just that bad at it. Yeah. Uh, representing the Chicago Sky now for, I think, a second podcast. That is uh, Maliki. Uh, I believe Crystal was our last podcast. Uh, I believe you would be up next then, Maliki. So uh, what is your thought? You're handed the keys. What are you doing right now? Right now, what I'm doing is taking all the stupid ads off of the wall and putting the uh, the retired number faces back on there. That's the first thing I'm doing. I was at the okay. game with Dante yesterday talking about just, I mean, it's like the goose the goose head thing. Like yeah. the vibes, just, it just took the vibes down. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, it, the easy answer is just say, you know, you, you clean house and, and you fire everybody and do, do a top-down thing. But just to, to be more specific, I think you really have to actually build a player development system and a farm system and a scouting system that isn't, you know, the equivalent, the kind of professional nepotism equivalent that is pretty common around sports, I guess. But everyone, I, I don't know much about the Sox scouting department. I do know about their, you know, their minor league operations. And it's it's the same it's the same old boys club you see everywhere. And the, the thing about the really good teams out there right now, the Astros, the the Dodgers, the Yankees, the Rays, the consistently really good teams, they have a plan from the top level of the big leagues all the way down through the minors. They're not just handing over the keys to Buddy Bell or to somebody, or Chris Getz or somebody, and they're saying, hey, here, have at it. You know, There's an actual like broad plan. As much as I hate the McKinseyifying, McKinseyifying, whatever the hell you want to say, of the sport and the world, like there has to be some kind of broader philosophy there. I don't think there is one right now, as much as they're going to deny it. So... I'd say the first thing I do is to see a gets, see a PD guys, you know, if the current iteration of the roster is screwed, let's at least try to start building from the ground up so that the next wave of actually good impact players you have, you don't end up in the same situation as we did in 2016, as we did in 2012, as we did are now when you have, oh, we've got two and a half really good pitchers, three and a half really inconsistent hitters. And, you know, the second somebody comes up, it all goes to hell because everyone's replacement level. So like raise the floor a little bit is my, is my plan. Now this is something that comes up a lot. Uh, when I talk with Darren on the farm podcast and, uh, or it's coming, uh, up more and more often because, you know, I'm proximity wise, I'm, I'm close to the rays. Um, even cover them a bit. Um, is it as simple as, I mean, my knee jerk, because I'm an idiot, my, my knee jerk is just like, okay, then buy the Rays scouting department, bring them all to Chicago and have them instill that. I know it's not that simple, but if you're really not going to be nuanced, and clearly I don't know that they can find, I'm not sure that Chris, you know, love him or hate him or whatever, you know, Chris Getz, I don't think is necessarily the second coming of player personnel, successes or, or, or failures in the system. I don't know that it's taken a huge step up, especially given the fact that the team's been you know, trying to devote, you know, trying to devote resources in a way maybe it hasn't, certainly in, in Ken Williams' era. I know it's not necessarily as easy as that, but I don't know that I trust them to make the right decision, not Jerry or or Rick or necessarily even Getz, to find those guys who will find the talent. So is it is it that silly just to say, you know what, here, uh, whoever's running it or or the or the the the, the underlings with the Rays or the Dodgers? I mean, I guess Dodgers are the wrong target because you're not going to offer them uh, a pay increase probably. But I mean, there's something to just trying to steal from who's doing it right, right? I mean, that is sort of the way all business works, including sports business. It, it's beg, borrow and steal. And that was what I, I kind of had as one of mine is that you look at those teams like the Dodgers, the Rays, the Braves, the Cardinals, the teams in the last 20 years that have had some success and you start plucking from their brain trusts and maybe not like the super high guys, but maybe some of the lower guys who are looking to move up or girls, I should say girls or guys looking to move up, but you know, maybe that opportunity isn't there within that system. And so you start plucking those brain trust folks and, and, but like a, like a collection of them, not just from the Rays or just from the Dodge, but like all of them and kind of have a collective and you get like the best of all the worlds. Um, it was kind of one of my thoughts. 
we literally had a you know front office member go to jail for trying to steal information from other teams like if the Sox aren't trying that's you know like you have to be constantly looking at everybody else and trying to gain as much information and whatever they're doing that's working well I'm going to do that until I can find my own thing that's going to you know be that next edge and they don't seem to have any willingness to do that um for whatever reason, uh, you know, from the top down, whether they're asked to or whether they just don't have the drive to or whether they just aren't crafty enough to. It does seem like farm system wise, they still are operating with one hand or half a hand, whatever hand in pocket, something tied behind their back because, you know, they're not maxing their international money. OK, maybe they've given up. on. Maybe they are actually using it all now. Uh, they're still drafting oddly. You know, there's still, I mean, you know, look at the guys, even who are with the big league club now, Jake Berger, you know, as a, as a, as a mid high first round pick, you know, is, is an interesting one thinking it would pan out as him being anything more than say uh, a DH, um, Zach Collins, Andrew Vaughn. I mean, ad infinitum, I, you know, I, it does seem like they almost are working against themselves. I'm I, probably cause they are, you know, you've probably got old school, you know, Ken Williams against maybe one person who is using some kind of analytics or some sort of insight that is maybe not being listened to. I don't know. Maybe they just have maybe, maybe they're just throwing darts against the wall because it wouldn't shock me given the product we, we see on the field. Um, all right. Yeah, the, <laughs> it's not a it's not a bad idea whatsoever, whether or not the White Sox could ever execute it. Malachi, I would love to put you in charge of that. So, yes, please. Um, in this fantasy scenario. Yes, please uh, re-inject the farm system with any sort of life whatsoever because it's been forever since it's ever. I don't know what the White Sox have ever. Um, Larry Himes, probably late 80s, last time the White Sox ever had a run of great, great first round picks, which basically fueled the White Sox through the 1990s. Uh, next up, seniority wise, I believe that is Adrian Serrano. He's on the six pack tonight, or not on the six pack. He's on the bird app tonight. I don't know how he's going to be able to cobble together. I mean, are they going to be positive trending? Are they going to be negative trending? I mean, I, I'm really sorry I put you in such a spot. It's going to be a very challenging uh, fill of the page for you, Adrian. But I appreciate you taking the time uh, for this podcast. What is your thought? You're handed the keys. What are you doing with this team to this team? <laughs> Short of blowing it up and blowing it up's an option. Um, I mean, I spoke a little bit earlier. Like, I definitely, like, this year, they have no choice but to wait as long as possible and just see what happens. But my, I think my, I come back to, like, you just I just want to do anything different. We've had 23 years of doing things basically the same, whether it's drafting the same way or your approach to an organization. And it's equated to this, you know, like to what we're watching right now. Like, so I don't know what the answer is. I don't know who could be, you know, anybody could be a better owner possibly than Jerry, but like you could always have a worse owner. You know, Bob Nutting could decide he wants to own two teams now. And, like, you know, then we're stuck with that. But just like you're looking at right now, like it's hard to find a category that the White Sox aren't both offensively pitching defense, like somewhere around 20 or lower everywhere. Um, and that's just there's nobody else, you know, there's nobody else coming <laughs> like there's nobody in the minors that's like right on the I mean, they have a bunch of guys that I could technically play you know, Jake Marsnick or, you know, Clint Frazier, they just picked up today. These guys technically could play in the major leagues, Billy Hamilton, but like, then you're basically just running out, you know, the 20, 22 Oakland A's, you know, like you're just, you're just bringing out guys that are bodies on the field and not really expecting anything. And like, maybe, you know, maybe that's what it is. Maybe by the end of this year, we're going to see projects outside and we're going to see, you know, Popeye and everybody else they could you know get a ticket to Chicago to come play and just see what happens but in the meantime like I would just like to see them literally just trying anything there needs to be some kind of shuffling there needs to be some kind of statement made to the players that regardless of who you were who drafted you how you got here what your stature was you need to earn your position every day and until there's a situation where that's you know the case we're going to keep having Luis Robert you know uh, losing focus, trying to steal balls from other outfielders. We're going to have, you know, whatever <laughs> sacrifice flies four feet away from second base. Like we just saw in this uh, game to start off today. Like there's, there's going to constantly be lapses because they're not focused on trying to be better every day outside of Jake Berger, who you constantly hear stories about even uh, Pedro talking about him this morning. He's doing the work every day. He's trying to win a position. He's trying to stay here. He's trying not to go back. He's got a baby. He needs the money, and he wants to stay in the major leagues. 
Um, and the rest of the guys, that's not. I don't think they're not working, but it feels like some of them are trying to not fail rather than trying to succeed. It just seems like you know the more they try, the tighter they get, and it just doesn't go well for them. So like, I would just like to see this organization try anything differently than they would have done. Take your first instinct, Rick, and just do the opposite. <laughs> the, fr- the freaky friday approach uh pro- could do no worse i mean you're you're almost the worst team in baseball so yeah it would stand to reason okay quickly taking the keys from crystal as one of the first and rare i don't think it's not ever happened but uh female owners in major league history melissa sage mullenbach you are now getting those keys you've taken over from Crystal as uh, the owner of the White Sox. So what are you doing to change this team like right, like tonight? Yes, so like that's like when I was thinking about this, I took like it like very literally and very like concrete. So I get it, what is my very first thing I'm gonna do? I am DFA yep. Mike Clevenger. Mm-hmm. The guy's toxic. If you're wanting to build a successful driven um, ball club, you don't need toxic abusers as a part of the club. So like absolutely the first thing I'm doing is I'm getting rid of him and his point for war because not only is he a bad person, he can't play baseball either and he can't pitch. So he's out. <laughs> the next thing I'm doing, so bear with me. The, like okay. I'm thinking very I'm thinking very outside the box here. Okay. Again, this is like what what can I do in this very moment? I at, like cover your eyes, cover your ears. I am moving Eloy to right field. Okay. He's going to be my new right fielder. I'm moving Gavin Sheets into the DH and I am optioning Oscar back to Charlotte so that he can develop because watching him in spring training, I do really feel like he has the potential to be a, a major league player. He, it was just it's, it was just too soon. And with seven games that he had last year in Charlotte, that just wasn't enough. Like that's a huge jump to make from double A to the majors with seven games. And, you know, when Eloy hurts himself in right field, then we can bring Oscar back up. You know, hopefully it'd be at least maybe a month um, to give the Oscar some more development down there. But Gavin Sheets, I mean, he is one of the only guys on this team who has like an OPS plus, like well over 100. Um, he's a lefty bat. He's a power guy. I also think he's one of those people that really wants it, that really wants a spot, but he's just, he's just not playing enough. Um, so, so that, that's, I know again, Eloy in right field, but the guy is a major league baseball player. Like if, <laughs> if he can't, if he can't go out there and play the position, what use is he to anything? So throw him out there, see if he can do it. If he hurts himself, well, then we just go back to what we were doing before. But I just think we're doing Oscar a big disservice um, having him up here right now. He is really struggling, and um, it could be some irreparable things if if we don't get mm. him kind of back down and up. And then the last thing I'm doing is I am taking every resource I have, and I am going to sign Shohei Otani in the offseason because how cool would it be to have a franchise player that you could build around? Um I, I would take whatever he wanted. I would beg Tadahito Oguchi to come back, be on my coaching staff, um, be you know a mentor uh, to Shohei, and that's my dream. Man, that is some stuff to uh, chomp into. Okay, Melissa, to the second point with the Illinois and right field, you managed to somehow, that's sort of like a microcosm of everything we're sort of talking about here. So I'm glad you brought that up. And, you know, I mean, the, the, the nuts and bolts of it, uh, aside, I mean, you know, the uh, your question of like he's a major league baseball player, he should be able to play right field. Yeah, well, you know, and look what we got. But yeah, the the uh, yeah, let, let's. Um, I'm going to jump in on your first point, but uh, let's uh, let's address. I mean, I guess to get Otani to Chicago, you actually do you really you hand him the keys to the team. You say, okay, Shohei, you can have the team now. Now, no, please play for the team too. Uh, but. <laughs> Um, the betting odds had, <laughs> I think I circulated that a month or so ago, had the White Sox about in the middle of the pack to get Shohei Otani. I think they were like 33 to but 1. But Crystal and I are owning the team. Oh, yeah. Oh, our- no, no, no. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm not making it. I'm, I'm not. Oh, I love it and go for it. But, I mean, what, you know, we're all sort of nodding our heads and smiling as Melissa says that. So, I mean, we are all in favor. Um, 
what do you have to lose if you're the White Sox, right? I mean, other than money that they don't apparently, you know, you just got to pry it out of the cold dead hands. But uh, absolutely, this is like about once in a lifetime. This is pretty close to a once in a lifetime opportunity for the White Sox. We know that they fall on their faces when they bring people like Bryce Harper to the United Center, but presuming uh, Crystal and Melissa are going to do this better, uh, yeah, wouldn't uh, is there any objection to that kind of plan? I mean, that's that's a phenomenal approach. No objection. I feel like we are very charming. If we have to set up a GoFundMe, um, <laughs> obviously, like Bennett, tell the team billboards were very well received so like if we have to start a gofundme <laughs> that's fine like just clear up some space clean a little house get shohei somehow i have a hundred dollars <laughs> when, when's the last time the Sox? i mean yeah like actually landed that player what is it albert bell i mean come oh, on. Mm-hmm. which you know uh, but mm-hmm. you, i mean give it give it to the team at the time at least they, yeah. they went for it but like I just don't understand what holds us back from being that team. We are in Chicago, like, but it's Jerry. And so that's why you have to go back to, we just need a new billionaire, which I don't know enough about what billionaires are available out there, but we need a new billionaire and new life and revamping. Here's, here's a tip, uh, Melissa, uh, peruse the police blotter. That's always one place to start looking uh, for billionaires, but okay. Enough about that, Brett. Um, Astute. Uh, Melissa, yes, the last time the White Sox employed the uh, highest paid player in baseball was Albert Bell. He actually made more than the, enti- than the entire Pittsburgh Pirates franchise in that season. And the nice part about it is Jerry Reinsdorf only did that as a massive middle finger to baseball because he didn't want to settle the strike. So he said, OK, if we have to play again, I'm going to go ahead and break the rules that I just held out and, and, and cried about. Um, so it was like, you know like a white elephant prize. And of and course, all we knows. got was two of the greatest offensive seasons yeah. in White Sox history out of it. Absolutely. All we got and it. wasn't he clever that he gave him the opt out if he wasn't high enough paid so he could leave. And it, I guess it did turn out okay. Cause his, you know, his, his hip blew up or whatever, but how dare, yeah. yeah. How dare he ask for more money after. Yeah. <laughs> after he fell out of the top three or ten. <laughs> yeah, really the gall. Oh my goodness. Um, Okay, let me piggyback. Uh, I guess it's my turn to draft. I guess this will, might wind up our segment, but this is going to be the widest range because now I, in the uh, whatever the number five spot is, not clean up. On uh, the number five spot, uh, I get to um, clean up everything everybody else didn't talk about. Uh, first of all, on Clevenger, that was mine uh, as well, Melissa. But let's take it a step further and even though it's our choice to believe it, it's our choice to believe in it, along with that DFA has to come the statement that says that is some form of mea culpa. And I know I'm going to, I'm going to mute all of you from your laughter, but uh, it has to come with a statement that says this was a mistake. Um, and I can know that's obvious and I know that's easy. And you know, like you're trying to cheat to get out, you know, to get out of it saying, Oh yeah, we made a mistake. Like somehow they didn't know how this was going to play out, but the words are still important and the meaning is still important. Uh, and I think along with just getting rid of the guy, because it's not what what is it even about now? As Melissa pointed out, it's not about the talent. It's not really about the money. If he was making more, well, he would never make more. His White Sox would never pay him more. If he was making less. He'd be he's what he'd be easier to get rid of. Uh, I, I think hand in hand with that has to come with we 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 really screwed up on this one. And there's a way to say that it doesn't make it seem <laughs> like we you know like they're the more they, that they're the laughing stock that they are. There's an earnest way to do that. In the same way that after. We all clamored for the White Sox to do more than a couple tweets, uh, BLM, hashtag BLM tweets, and when uh, a, a lot of uh, individuals and sites like ours uh, took the White Sox to the shed over the fact that they were uh, uh, passing on an opportunity to say anything meaningful at all, I believe, and then published our, our letter along with a lot of our SBN sister sites, uh, I believe as a direct response, you had Ken Williams come out and and put together probably the, the 30 minutes of, of video that's the most extraordinary of his life. It, 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 it took courage and it, it did a lot to make up for how they had swung and missed about five times at the plate. Uh, it is possible to repair the damage done with something even like a Clevenger sign. So I think that has to go hand in hand. All right. Uh, 
discussion will come after this because the obvious thing is come but it's we're recording on friday come saturday morning all of the offices are empty the owner's office is empty the general manager's office is empty i like ken williams ken williams is his stuff is in a box on a curb by this uh on the corner of third fifth and shields uh ev every single person i'm sorry if it's guilty by association there's a clever person i'm sorry uh heir apparent gm chris gets you are the entire i don't we will operate without any front office whatsoever for a few days or a week or the rest of the season what does it matter the season's lost making no moves if you're the white Sox, making no moves is a positive move uh everybody's office is vacant and of course that's the owner i guess we got an arrange a sale whatever no everybody's locked out it's uh, it's well past time for this to be over uh, I know it's the White Sox, so it'll never happen because it's family or whatever hackneyed thing. It's family when it sort of matters, but when it uh, when it comes to uh, uh, you know the Bat Boys and the Miners or the former trainers or <laughs> theme, the female fan base, well, I guess you're sort of family. Uh, so I don't buy that. Um, that doesn't fly any longer. So you're all gone. Uh, and I imagine this was the easy choice any of you could have made. So thank you for letting me say it. But the entire front office is gone. I don't think there's anybody to spare. Uh, Pe Pedro gets to continue to manage because we, we uh, you know, I don't know. I don't have anybody. We're not hiring AJ. I mean, we're, I don't have anybody uh, uh, in mind immediately to hire. Uh, so nothing needs to be rushed here necessarily. The only thing that needs to be rushed is they don't ever get back into the stadium. Ever. I don't even know if they have to come back for a 2005 celebration. Maybe we'll, we'll let things, they've let Ozzy back in. So I guess, I guess there's no rules there, but even that's going to need, we're going to need a cooling off time there. Uh, so the obvious, which is burn the entire front office to the ground, including ownership is, is I guess is going to be my suggestion. I assume there isn't a lot of objection, but there are any caveats uh, to that plan that we need to somehow preserve because, because many of you were a little more polite, like let's shift Eloy to right field or, you know, let's boost the farm system. But uh, uh, the clear cutting of this forest here isn't exactly uh, a bad move, I wouldn't think. No, everybody at the very least should be re-interviewing with whoever is now in charge. You know, like you don't necessarily like you don't want to lose anybody that might have been stifled by, you know, the Rick Hans of the world trying to be the smartest guy in the room. But like nobody should be safe. Everybody should have to tell me what you do here. <laughs> How long? Here's here? what I picture, Adrian. If I could just interrupt, I, I I picture Chris Getz showing up to that interview with like White Sox logo cookies his wife made, and like bringing them and just setting them there and being like, "This is what I did the first time. What this isn't good enough." <laughs> yeah, I want Chris Getz going back to his office wherever it is and finding that his red stapler is missing. You know, <laughs> like we just need to correct the error, <laughs> like. Is there is there something worth maybe let's take it this way is there something worth preserving in the brain trust here that we would want to make sure uh who maybe didn't find all their stuff I, mean, I don't know it could be media relations i don't know um is there anything worth uh preserving i know this is haha it's unrealistic it's never gonna happen but you know yes you're gonna, you're gonna keep the the community relations folks the the folks that do the uh you know all the good all right fundraising and yeah christine o'reilly okay her, christine all right. yes uh, everyone that's on her team they're, they're just phenomenal people their hearts are in the right place and they are so committed to this community like their passion for the community of chicago and the surrounding areas i mean all the way even down to central illinois um it's it's very deep and i yes they get to keep their jobs okay <laughs> Okay, to prevent the tear jerking, we will uh, we'll temporarily relocate them to Birdo Center or some okay. you know, anonymous like strip mall in the suburbs, just for like a month. Just let them stay there because yeah, it's going it's going it's going to be ugly. So, all right, uh, Christine and staff, you're already relocated. <laughs> Everybody else is locked out. Uh, anything else we need to pres preserve uh, on this team? I feel like we should keep the poor social media team that has to just be <laughs> battered down every single night even though it's not their fault like i feel like if anything they deserve a raise and like let's find, put, let's find them a job that's non-customer facing for a while yeah, yeah like with that person as gm at this point like whoever completely runs that department 
boom, you're the new general manager because you have faced so much adversity mm-hmm. and people are just total assholes to you on a nightly basis. Like bump them up, give them a big raise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can go along with that. Depending on how long, long tenured they are. I mean, they've, they've made plenty of gaffes too, but definitely in terms of uh, the, the recent sample size. Yes, they certainly deserve at least. How about this, Crystal? I'll promise them at least a very nice edible arrangement at minimum. They can leave with an edible arrangement. Maybe Is it like the- edibles? As in, okay. can you I didn't say where I was going to buy it. Edibles, Brett. <laughs> can you define edibles? Because I feel like they really deserve like the primo edible arrangement. Okay, I will circulate a little sheet. They can check whichever edible box they need, and that's fine. We can make that yeah, work. Just, of course, come I don't on. I think they need to check it. Like just, just, <laughs> just find out it. one of the stores. All like, right. Yeah. Pick that's a fair assumption. All right. Yeah. So then I think the only other guy that I think could make the list is Saad Father. He's back from his injury. I think like he's done nothing but an exemplary job at what he's asked to do. It's a very niche market, but like he does it very well. Like we need more guys that have less oversight, but do their one job very well. The one, you mean the one nepotism hire that's actually ever worked out for the White Sox? Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a good call. All right. Bastards forever. Uh, uh, Brand, uh, Brand, I mean, is, is Brandon actually a son in the White Sox system or not? I mean, he's obviously a, a relative. I'm not sure if he's a son or not. He can eventually, providing his uh, playing career doesn't uh, pan out, he can eventually move up. He can maybe be the next uh, groundskeeper. That's fine. Yeah, I got no problem. Just just chisel uh, uh, Bastard on the wall instead of a nameplate. That's fine. Uh, Malachi, anything that you can think of, of um, to preserve from this group? No, nah, that really sums it up with what Melissa and Crystal were saying. And my, I think my, my general vibe is that if you have had to publicly bear the brunt of the ire caused by the current front office decision-making group's decisions, whether you're in the ticket office, be an usher, you know, at the windows, whatever, then yeah, you can, you can get a you can get a shot. You can stick around. You deserve to get a chance to see the other side of uh, mm-hmm. the other side of the rainbow, you know, but mm-hmm. As far as the people who actually have an impact on what happens on the baseball field, mm-hmm. I'm very hard pressed to find anything or anybody worth worth yes. keeping in the zip code. Yes. To specify when I say front office locked out, it's definitely sweet class and above. Certainly the rank and file, although I'm sure there's a few uh, tone deaf there too, uh, and folks who probably do need to be handed their walking papers oh we can sort all that later that's yeah, would, that's that's small potato stuff i would make one request to change your plan rather than have them arrive with all of their stuff on the sidewalk <laughs> i would like them to perp walk out during <laughs> walk the stadium day i want i want a giveaway day saturday <laughs> tomorrow i want kenny and i want rick walking the concourse with their boxes heading on out <laughs> never to yeah. come back they yeah could make a bobblehead of like each of them just carrying their boxes and like Mm -hmm. it's a surprise who you get Mm -hmm. yeah uh, oh and then the stuff that they they weren't able just to gather in our i mean this is starting to get a little bit twisted but okay yeah the stuff they can't just gather in their arms hey that's a flash garage sale all right flash garage sale like tomorrow morning it's gone sorry that autographed world series blankety blank whatever on the wall if you didn't grab it Hey, it's somebody's lucky bid. All right. Yeah, Melissa, show up early. Uh, make, <laughs> get the bidding going. Um, okay, uh, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, we got a little bit more. Um, oh, I don't know if this was serious. I guess maybe a little less serious. I don't know. Uh, but we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back in a second and uh, get toward wrapping this up. As we've already, we've, we've drastically improved the Chicago White Sox, even for 2023, much less for generations of poor fans. Oh, <laughs> you poor fans uh, to come. All right, we'll take a break. We'll be back. White Sox fans, I am Brett Balantini. I'm hosting Sox Populi podcast number 144 on the Fans First Sports Network. Thank you for joining us. Hope you've learned some things or been entertained or, I don't know, trying to figure out what edible you would would choose in your edible arrangement gift basket. I don't know. Whatever it is you're doing, I'm glad you're still with us. Uh, Thanks for hanging around. Uh, Now I want to um, speed round-ish. Uh, but I want to follow up on what, I mean, we've thrown a few ideas, you know, this, the garage sale is one of them, but also uh, Zach putting the the faces, faces, names back on the wall uh, in the, I won't call it trivial, but I'm the, in the less perhaps significant, uh, what are some other, what what is the one change you would make that is, you know, like less, with less ramifications, I'll use uh, Malachi's um, uh, example of putting 
players back on the wall, which, which seems sort of like a no-brainer. But um, uh, what are some other things we do? Just you know, um, you know, more snap, maybe even more trivial, but that would still make uh, the White Sox uh, easier to watch or experience. I I would let fans um, from the 500 level down to the 100. Level. <laughs> yeah, you think? Good lord. <laughs> I mean, come on. That's the stupidest policy it's ever. Stupid and it's been like, policy. what, three decades? It's never changed. Yeah. Like, I, <laughs> I, I when Sage and I were talking about going, and he was like, oh, we could just get, like, get cheap seats, mom. And I'm like, no, because if we get cheap seats, we're just stuck in the 500 level. So, yes, I'm making the fan experience better so that they can go to the store, they can go to the fundamentals thing. And, you know, we're like not like separating out the, like the economic classes yeah leave it to jerry to like reinstate like the groundlings concept in like the 21st century baseball for god's sake Uh, yeah that's a that's a great one that's a no-brainer i mean i sort of get the concept maybe when you're drawing forty thousand a game when you're selling out when you're when you're the draw in town but that's been a while too white Sox. so you could give away those seats you know (laughs) <laughs> and let people down. Like I remember when that, like they were drawing a lot of people, and they weren't doing that. It was still fine. Like mm. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, All right, that's a good one. Yeah, Crystal. I would say you know after Melissa DFA's redacted player, they donate a huge amount of money to a domestic violence organization. Yeah either nationwide or even just in the state of Illinois, they, you know, you recognize you did something bad, you get rid of the problem and then you put your money where your mouth Mm -hmm. is and just Mm -hmm. donate a bunch of money. Cause I Mm -hmm. I feel like I would feel better about watching this team if I knew they were actually doing something good. Yeah. I think hand in hand with what I threw out there of, of the statement that says not only we're getting rid of this guy. So thank goodness we cut out the cancer. Well, here's the treatment to keep it away. Uh, and here's what we're going to do, not only in the future, but here's what we're going to do about the fact that we did make this mistake. And again, I, I know you can't, you're not going to immolate, you know, there's no self-immolation here. I get it that Rick Conner, if he makes a statement or whoever makes a statement, you know, has to say in a way that doesn't make him out to be the clown. I guess we all like sense he might be, he's a human being. And I, I was assume there's something, <laughs> there's some conflict in, there's some inner conflict here. Right? He did not, he did not betray that in spring training, which is very, very annoying. Uh, but I, yeah, I would think it would be a given that you say, okay, now here are the reparations we're going to try to make for this mistake we've made, um, you know, without self-flagellating, like almost as just performance art, but really let's do something to try to like, <laughs> if nothing else, let's talk to half the fan base and say, okay, here's why we'd like you to come back and, and maybe make it realize it is a little safer than you thought. Um, if you can just sort of excuse this last six months, I don't know how you do that, but at least they're trying they're doing the thing they need to do to try to get people back it may not work uh, other more uh, small or, or or minor things not not of course that that is one but the goose the goose has got to come back yeah i would bring the, the goose back for sure um i would wear the south side uh city connects more often they just feel fun i like seeing them we only see them on tuesday night home games or Monday night home games. I don't know what the rule is now, but it seems like they kind of put them to the background and I would like to see them more often. Um, I would like the goose to come back. Definitely. Um, If not having a separate uh, mascot, that's also a goose to follow Southpaw around. Possibly Southpaw could ride them. I don't know. I have some (laughs) ideas if they want to reach out. I have some ideas to at least make it uh, fun. Uh, If we can get fans into the park, quicker than you know like 45 minutes to an hour through the gates like that would be great. <laughs> man you this is quite a wish list <laughs> i don't know adrian uh yeah okay and listen melissa i don't want you to make it break down in tears but on that note get rid of the 83s give them a rest put them in storage for a while they are not necessary any longer it's cool they might be they might be our coolest past uniform that's debatable uh, cause we saw a field of dreams. They're probably not, but okay. Can we just give them a rest? If not rotate, uh, a, as I've mentioned on this podcast, probably every other podcast rotate a, an anniversary, uh, the white Sox have like 8,000 past 
you know, uniforms. That's a merchandising opportunity. Why it's like, now granted, the 500 level can get to that merchandising, but you know, all, all the rest of the real fans can. Uh, but yeah, just, and maybe the, maybe the easy slide is City Connects on Sunday. I mean, it would just seem like you'd want to play that up a little more. And just, can we skip for a second? I mean, it's not like we didn't just have Tony La Russa back for one of the, like the most embarrassing two seasons in White Sox history. So uh, maybe we just give them a rest until like the 2030s. I don't know. Uh, anyhow, uh, Maliki, what do you got other than uh, uh, the wall? Do you have any other uh, small, small items, I guess? Bring back Nancy, or at least no! let, at least let, if, if Lori is even still there, play more than like once every 18 games for like 10 minutes a game. Mm-hmm. You know, I really... I really love Rihanna. I don't need to hear like the chorus to S and M blaring sixteen times a game at a gazillion decibels when there's sixteen people in the ballpark, so it sounds like you're a speaker a half inch away from your face. I'm not one of those. I'm not like a total, you know, philistine who's like I really I don't want any screens or canned music or anything like that. But like that would that's one small thing that i think would actually make the joyless experience of watching this team actually a little bit nicer in in the moment at the park yeah, yeah absolutely we don't need to start lighting um uh, the night game lights um you know we need to make them like lighting kerosene lamps we don't need to go that far back but yeah nancy honor and you know and again you're right i mean if Lori is still a, a fixture at the park i mean we're not going to just run over her her but the idea well yeah the whole the whole in-game presentation is it's some, some twisted, made worse by the fact that yeah, sometimes there's 15 people in the park. Uh, our colleague Dante Jones, I think, has been to. I, I, he may represent about 15 percent of attendance this year at White Sox Park. So well done, Dante. They should probably get you into the sweet class at some point because uh, you've earned it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Little things to little things. Now I want to know. Uh, we're going to wrap up with uh, I don't know sort of a speed roundy kind of thing, but I just could be good, could be bad. And let's face it, it's probably going to be bad given the way this team is trending. And now suddenly the surprise race to the bottom of the White Sox are embroiled in here in 2023, in the middle of the so-called contention window. What's the next thing that's going to happen? I want to know something that's somewhat, not just they're going to lose tonight to Tampa, whatever, uh, or they're gonna, there's going to be an embarrassing play on the field that's going to make the White Sox look like they've never played baseball before because that happens every day. Uh, what's the next big thing that's going to happen? The managerial firing, resignation, injury. Uh, what's what's going to happen next? I am going to start up. I'm going to go back to Crystal. Crystal, uh, what's the next thing? Okay, well, first I would like to interrupt and say they're actually up 2-1 to one right now. Oh, my um, gosh. Right Shame on me. Andrew. Andrew. And Pedro was ejected after Luis Robert was hit and actually got into the ump's face, like right. nose to nose. It was, it was wonderful. Pedro's he feeling the want, heat. He doesn't want to watch the socks either. No, <laughs> no. Um, so, okay. What's what happens next? <sighs> Honestly, I just, it, it's not even Jerry anymore. I just want Rick to go and, Take a long walk up, walk up a short pier because I'm just so sick of that man. So just fire him. Okay. If they fire him after this game tonight, win or lose, I'd be happy. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're having another podcast. Sorry. Yeah. I'm dragging all of you out of bed. And yes, we're having another podcast. Uh, but okay. But notable, you are hoping this is the next thing that happens, but you by no means think this is, think this is the next thing. That oh, happens. I mean, it, it won't, but that's okay. wishful thinking. Okay. So uh, okay. Crystal, Crystal opts for the Christmas list, which is perfectly fine. But Melissa, what is the next thing that is going to happen? Um, I, but the Pedro thing, that, that could have been an option. Him just getting ejected, him realizing, oh, man, wait a minute. <laughs> I might have a contract, but. That was the second game in a row, too, that he's been ejected. Oh, Jeez, Pedro was really feeling it. Oh, sorry, Griffal. Okay, uh, Melissa, what is the next thing you think is going to happen that's maybe just a, not what we're expecting? Well, I don't know if it's... So, you know, Liam, they were talking about how he's going to, pretty soon, he's going to have his physical and he's going to be on a rehab assignment. And so he's had this, you know, journey that's been so trying and he's come through like such a champ. 
and then he's going to come back and then we're not going to have any games for him to save. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just going to be awful because he's going to like come back to the team and then like, what's he going to do? He's going to come in when it's eight to two and try to close the door in the ninth. Like it is like the most like wah, wah, wah. Yeah. yeah. I hope he'll get his helmet. He'll pinch run. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Malachi, what is the next thing maybe that we're not expecting that is going to happen with the Chicago White Sox? Um, well, we've already seen a pretty substantially sized brawl break out as Nuck If You Buck plays in the background. So my next mm -hmm. prediction is that a tussle in the right field crowd over a disputed ending to the Italian beef race spills over into the visitor's bullpen. Um <laughs> Uh, while fight song by D12 plays in the Ooh, background. This wow. is, this is, um, I've seen it. I'm don't just put the money on it now. Thank okay. you later. It's all right. I, I need it on record that cheesy beef is a cheater <laughs> and a liar and <laughs> does not deserve to be in this race anymore. If I was clever enough, this would be the audio clip to send out uh, from the podcast, although there have been many, many highlights. Uh, Maliki, very well done. And yes, all right, when I find that betting line, I'm not a betting man and to test it myself, but I will place that bet. Because what do we have that. a giant fucking Caesar Sportsbook sign for over that thing if not, to, if not for that? Why is that even there? You can't even get them. Like... It's a sponsorship waiting to happen. Uh, it really is. Sponsored oh, fights, put the lines down. I'm, don't it's right in front of me. Here for me. Yeah, I mean, they should be letting me bet on people throwing fast pitch in right center. You know, <laughs> what is what's what's like? Let me have fun while I'm there. This game's two hours long. I got to get my money's worth. White Sox. We always say our ideas are free. That one's not free. When you steal that from Adrian, you better give him something. Give him a wow, whatever it is, let him, let him be, be cheesy beef. Let him, uh, uh, uh run it honest. Come on. Uh, Adrian, what do you got for the thing that is going to happen that, <laughs> I mean, I don't expect you to follow up a Maliki there, but, um, if, uh, following up with Melissa, uh, Liam actually, I think he, they just posted, he had four strikeouts in a Arizona game today. So it's nice to see wow. him actually throwing pitches. Um, and, uh, what's going to happen next is Liam and Tim Anderson are going to be back and Yohan Mankata might never be heard from again. Like, I don't know what's going on with this, but I hope that Rick takes this brand new medical team with him wherever yeah. he's going to end up going because like they're not doing anything here. So um, yeah. um, I think from a, but uh, from a team perspective, I think they're going to be a 500 baseball team because I think that's what they are. Man, wow, if only I could optimism from Adrian. No, if I if it was if I, if I was uh if I was able just to cut myself off, boy, we just end there because there's your positive mic drop of this podcast that maybe wasn't so positive. This was initially billed as just the scream podcast. I did try to twist it into something somewhat short of screaming, and I don't think I have the voice any longer to scream the way I really need to to truly curdle the blood, but boy, I could try. And if this team keeps playing the way it does, we will have, yes, we will have the Scream Therapy podcast session. So keep tuning in to the Fans for Sport Network. Again, this is this is the best spot. You know you're listening to this, every one of these episodes. And of course, visiting Dugout as well. Um, uh, yeah, okay, Adrian, 500 team. Sure, yeah, I believe you. Wow, okay, edible arrangement. Okay, now uh, let me give you one. It's pretty straight, and I think it's going to happen because it's just how the White Sox operate, despite what I said about clean house. I say Pedro Grafal gets fired because there needs to be a fall guy, and it ain't going to be Rick, it ain't going to be Jerry, it ain't going to be Ken. It's not going to be the hitting coach. And plus, they already have the guy maybe they sort of maybe wanted to hire anyway. He's already in the dugout. Apparently, somebody told me he was still in the dugout, Mon Montoya, right? Montoya, Charlie Montoya, I think. Uh, so, you know. That's the guy they probably like. They probably want him to co-manage or something anyway. So uh, it's not like they actually have to do a search. Nobody has to bake any cookies for the interview, uh, the automatic ascendance interview. So, Or maybe they'll just give it to Chris Getz. Chris Getz will be the new manager, whatever. But yeah, I think Pedro, despite his uh, desperation, uh, arguing and showing the, t the team that he's got his back and he's now ejected, maybe. And, and okay, in addition to that, Pedro will get ejected from every game until he's fired. How about that? I'll throw that one in because we just we got a little bit of a fighting theme, except for Adrian's 
Peace and love and 500 team Chicago White Sox. Uh, okay, everybody, please carry with you the spirit that Adrian Serrano has about the Chicago White Sox. The 500 Chicago White Sox uh, will be back talking to you about the pending win streak that will get them back to 500 in maybe a week or so. Uh, we do have probably our next episode is going to be sort of a special edition, as if this wasn't special enough, uh, that I think we're going to do a little bit of a show and tell because we want to talk about the White Sox without talking about the White Sox. That really is the key here. I know that's uh, also a challenge for Crystal O'Keefe on visiting Doug How do I preview an upcoming series without really talking about the team we don't want to talk about? Uh, it is a challenge. So this is something we're probably going to do uh, probably a week or so from now. Uh, but we'll see whatever other emergency podcast there needs to be, like if somebody's fired and we need to have like a 3 a.m. one. Well, we're coming right back at you tonight. Sorry, everybody. But um, thank you, Melissa Malachi. <laughs> the, key the, ah, the fight is filling over from the stands. Delicious. Uh, Crystal O'Keefe, who you'll hear from, I'm sure, very like any day now, any second now, I'm visiting a dugout, and Adrian Serrano, our spirit captain here. The good vibes segment of this podcast belongs to Adrian Serrano. Thank you, Adrian, for representing. And uh, I don't think I've ever got the name of the cat, but the cat has made enough cameos. Uh, your your co-host in your studio there, Adrian, is? He's, uh, it's BB. He's okay. very needy. Um, okay. And he also hates cheesy beef. Yeah, he was show he was showing a little flank there, so I think yeah, that, that's fair. All right, noted, BB, noted. All right, BB, your your moment of fame. Another another clip to tweet out. Uh, thank you, Adrian, for keeping the spirits high. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Hey, you're still here and you're listening. God bless you for doing that. Uh, we'll be back probably sooner than you are ready for us to be. But uh, until then, well, we'll be around watching just like you. <laughs>